Okay, so we'll now prove this claim, which basically just condenses uh, a whole bunch of assertions all at once, basically that this thing exists, that it is a sigma algebra, that it contains B, and that it is the smallest such sigma algebra. Notice that we're using this cursive S, so, so I'll call this the calligraphic S, and this the cursive S. And cursive S is defined to be uh, the set of all sigma algebras containing B. So if anything is in this cursive S, it is a calligraphic S. That calligraphic S is a sigma algebra and contains B as a subset. So that's the definition of the cursive S. And we're intersecting over all of the sigma algebras that are in cursive S. That's what this thing is. So we'll claim that it is the smallest sigma algebra containing B. First to show that it exists, uh, well, we just need to know that the sort of indexing set, so to speak, uh, contains at least one element. And indeed, the power set is always a sigma algebra and uh, it always, uh, well, it contains every subset, so it definitely contains B. So uh, by having those properties, it must be in the cursive S, and so this intersection exists, it's well-defined. Um, so, uh, next we'll show that it, right, this intersection is a sigma algebra. So we have to show that the empty set, to begin with, is in that intersection. Well, to show that anything is in the intersection, you have to show that it is contained in every single one of these calligraphic S's. Right? That's what it is to be in the intersection, is to be in every single one of them. So, well, every single one of these is, by assumption, a sigma algebra, and sigma algebras, by definition, contain the empty set. So every single one of them contains the empty set, therefore the intersection over them contains the empty set. Okay, let's show co closure under complement. Well, if you take anything out of this intersection, I need to show you that the complement of that thing is also in the intersection. But since it's in the intersection, by definition, it is in every single one of those calligraphic S's that are contained in cursive S. They are all uh, sigma algebras and therefore closed under complement. So a complement is in all of those as well. And since a complement is in every single one, then it's in the intersection. Same argument for union. It's so similar that I just won't even go into it. It you know, sh should be very doable, um, just almost verbatim, I, I would say. Anyway, um, so uh, I also want to show that B is contained within this intersection, and the argument is very similar. You know, here we just know that by definition of the cursive S, every sigma algebra in it contains B as a subset. That's just by definition. And then, you know, since it's in every single one of them, it's in the intersection. Uh, as a subset this time, but, you know, if you want, you can argue it element-wise, I suppose. It's up to you, but it should be clear. Um, anyway, so the last thing to do is show that this intersection is the smallest such sigma algebra which means that if you take any other sigma algebra that also contains B as a subset, we want to prove that our sigma algebra, this intersection, is contained within tau. So, uh, well, this is a nice little uh, quick proof, nice cute move, which is notice that um, tau is assumed to be a sigma algebra that contains B. Therefore, by definition of cursive S, tau is in cursive S, right? And so, you know, I'm going to give a pretty fast version of the argument here, but that just means that the intersection is contained within tau, right? I mean, uh, if you take anything out of the inter... Oh, here, I'll give, I'll give the slightly more full version of the proof. Take any element out of this then it must be in every single cursive S. We have already argued that tau is one of those cursive S's, so the element is in tau. That's basically the argument. Okay, that completes the argument. We now know that no matter what X you pick, no matter what B you pick contained in the power set, 
the smallest sigma algebra containing B exists and actually is also equal to this thing. Okay, so uh, next we're going to actually, you know, put this thing to use, right? Again, we're talking about the sigma algebra because we want to put a restriction on the domain of M star, hoping that by uh, performing this restriction, we will get uh, countable additivity. And, um, but we want it to be well-behaved and our notion of well-behaved is being a sigma algebra. So, um, so let's try to get some sigma algebra on the real numbers, uh, which is not just the power set. So this is gonna be the first one that we get. It's not gonna be the only, and it's not going to be the most important, but it will be a very important one. So let's start here. And it's kind of natural, right? Given that what we've kind of said all along is that we want to get this sigma algebra that is a restriction down from the power set of the real numbers, but we also want one that contains every interval because again, our intervals are our sort of primary notion of measurable sets. Um, and it makes sense to look for the sigma algebra that contains the intervals. These are called the Borel sets, right? And we know that we can consider the smallest sigma algebra containing all intervals, or if we wanted to specify, we could talk about all open interval, intervals or whatever. So it makes sense to get that sigma algebra. We call it the Borel sets. Now, it's often worth noticing that this sigma algebra can be defined in many different ways, and each one of them can be useful depending on your situation, your context. So I actually don't want to commit myself to just one definition of the Borel sets. A common way to define the Borel sets is the sigma al algebra generated by all open sets. Uh, it's worth knowing that that's the same as the sigma algebra generated by all closed sets. Here's the one that I prefer the most as, as you know, like at least, you know, from the direction that I've been approaching this entire topic, I would, you know, take this to be the primary definition of the Borel sets, the sigma algebra ge generated by all open intervals. Um, but it's equivalent to all the others, and you know, you could also use the closed intervals, it doesn't matter, right? All of these sigma algebras are the same sigma algebra, the Borel sets. But it's not enough just to claim that. We have to prove that these definitions are all equivalent to each other, so that's what we do next. Um, by the way, I also want to point out, these are not the only ways, right? I mean, we could take half open intervals, uh, rays, right? We could take uh, intervals that start at a point and go off to infinity, and if that's all that we had, right, if we generated only using the rays, we would still get the Borel sets. Uh, so there are many, you know, you could also do like uh, intervals that have rational numbers as their endpoints. Those also generate all uh, the, the, the same thing, the Borel sets, right? So, I, so although I'm giving four uh, equivalent definitions of the Borel sets, there are many more as well. But anyway, we're not gonna need them, at least not for a little while. So let's go ahead and prove this theorem that all of these definitions are equivalent. So, um, to show that the first one, right, this sigma algebra is contained within this sigma algebra, we just have to show that this sigma algebra contains all the open sets, right? Because keep in mind, because it is the sigma algebra generated by all uh, open sets, that makes this one, number one, the smallest sigma algebra containing all the open sets. So if we show that this sigma algebra also contains all the open sets, and this one by definition is the smallest such, then this one must be contained in that one. So that's the proof strategy. So we just have to show that this sigma algebra contains all the open sets. Now, if you take any open set, call it G, we know that its complement is closed, and we know that this sigma algebra contains all the closed sets. 
Well, it's a sigma algebra, so it's closed under complements, and when we take the complement, we get g again. And that, right, so now we have that the open set, this arbitrarily chosen open set, is contained within number two here. Proof complete, right? So we now know that uh, one is a subset of two. Showing the other way around is just as easy, so I completely skip it. Um, showing that this one is contained within number one is completely trivial by exactly the same kind of argument because we know that the open intervals are open sets. But the reverse direction is, uh, is a lot harder. So um, how are we going to show that every open set is in the sigma algebra generated by the open intervals, right? Because not every open set is an open interval, but we want to show that somehow if you, uh, you know, put together enough open intervals, that can get you any uh, open set. Well, the, it turns out that the, all, all the putting together that we have to do is just unioning. And in fact, it turns out that we only have to union a countable collection of disjoint open intervals in order to construct any open set. Now, we don't really care about disjointness. That's not necessary here. But it will be useful later on. And so while we're at it, we might as well point out that when we do this, we can actually do it with disjoint open intervals. But anyway, okay, so let's, so let's state this lemma that, you know, as soon as we have this lemma, then this direction will be done. But we need this lemma, that every open set is a countable union of, in, in fact, disjoint open intervals. Um, so here's the proof. How do, you know, how do we get started on the proof? I mean, you take an arbitrary open set. How, you know, how do you find these open intervals that if you put them together, if you union them, uh, will get you back to this open set? I mean, you know that you can take any point, and because it's open, there's a neighborhood that fits around that point and stays inside of the open set. So that's a little open interval, which is very nice, right? That sounds like what we want. But you can't just take the collection of all of them because that'll be an uncountable collection of open intervals. So you have to do something a little bit more subtle. What you really want is you don't want to take like every one of these open intervals associated with every single point. Um, rather, you want to be more conservative and you kind of imagine if, if you have any, you know, uh, point and the open interval that it's contained within, you want to kind of grow that out, right? Like use that one interval to cover as much of the open set as you possibly can. <clears throat> um, so that rather than using like this whole infinity of open intervals, you're using just one to capture all of those parts of the open set. And then you want to write like whatever you didn't capture with that interval, you want to capture with another one and another one until you've kind of captured the entire open set. But how do we sort of make rigorous this notion of like growing the interval out and then having some uh, reason for thinking that when you get them all, uh, that you have a countable collection of open intervals? Well, uh, you know, in a sense, you want to kind of put all those points that are in the same open interval, you want to put them all together kind of in the same open interval and just take that one open interval. So that's kind of like partitioning the open set into all of these open intervals. And so maybe we define an equivalence relation on our open set. By the way, I'm, I'm going to call G the open set that we're considering here. Um, and, and the equivalence relation will be that two numbers in G are related to each other if and only if they, there exists some interval, uh, open interval, that contains them both, right? They share an open interval. Um, so uh, the fact that this is an equivalence relation is very easy, right? You know, you, you would just say like, okay, reflexivity, right? That every X is related to itself, right? That every X shares some open interval with x, 
would come from basically just what we've already talked about, that, that, um, that G is an open set, so for any point in it, uh, there exists an interval containing that point, and obviously then it, it, it shares that interval with itself in a trivial sense. Um, okay. Uh, how about symmetry? Well, if any two points share an open interval, then just reverse the order. The order doesn't matter, pretty obviously. Uh, transitivity, very, you write same thing, right? If x and y are in the same interval and y and z are in the same interval, then x and y, or x and z are in the same interval, so very direct. Okay, so it's an equivalence relation, and therefore it partitions the set. Now, we want to know that every cell in the equivalence, or sorry, every cell in the partition is an open interval. I mean, that's basically right now that we have all of, you know, these cells, and we know that if you union the cells together, you get the entire set because that's how a partition is. And we know that they're all disjoint from each other because, again, that's how a partition is. Um, then that'll basically, right, is, it, it, you know, then we'll know that we've got, you know, our set broken up into a bunch of open intervals. And then all we have to do is show that there are only countably many cells. But for now, let's just uh, try to prove that each cell is an open interval. Now, uh, that's pretty direct, right? Because we already know it's open, so then all we have to do is show that it's an interval. But what is it to be an interval? Well, basically, an interval is just a connected set of real numbers. So, in effect, that just means that if you take any two points, we want to show that all of the intermediate points are contained within the set. Um, but, uh, we know that, um, you know, there exi right, for any two points in a cell, we know that they share an interval, like there's an interval containing them both, and that interval contains all the intermediate points. So it's pretty easy, right? I, I ba it basically just talked out the proof, um, but it should be easy enough to take that little talk and justify that, uh, that the cells are connected open sets and therefore are open intervals. Okay, now how do we know that there are countably many cells? Well, if you have, right, since we know that each cell is an interval, and every interval, open interval, every open interval, non-empty, uh, of real numbers uh, must contain at least one rational number. And moreover, since these cells are disjoint, they each contain a rational number uniquely, right? Like for any interval, it contains a rational number that is not contained in any other interval. So we can associate these intervals with any arbitrary choice of a rational number contained within it. And since that is a subset of all possible rational numbers, it must be countable. And that concludes the proof, right? So we now know that every open set is a countable union of open intervals. And, uh, and because of that, uh, we know that uh, any open set is contained within this sigma algebra generated by the open intervals. And so that part of the proof is now complete. And we now know, right? So we now know that one is equivalent to two. And one is equivalent to three, so the first three are all equivalent to each other. And showing this last one, right, is equivalent to, you know, the easiest one is going to be showing that it's equivalent to number three. But that's really easy and obvious, right? We've, we've frequently already uh, sort of seen how you can take a union of growing closed intervals to produce any uh, open interval and vice versa. So showing the equivalence of three and four uh, involves the sorts of tricks and moves that we've already used a few times.